Hello, everyone, and welcome to Schwab Coaching. My name is Cameron May, and this is Selecting an Option Strategy. Filling in for Ken Rose today. He'll be back again next, next go around. But you know, options are full of choices. The whole world of options trading full of choices. Today, we're going to be talking about how an options trader might select an expiration and a strike price for a new long option position. Should be a good discussion. There are probably going to be some revelations even for some veteran traders out there. So I'm looking forward to it. Before we can get to that, though, let me first of all say hello to everybody out there in YouTube land. Great to see Robert and Tom, Naresh, Scott, everybody else. Thanks for joining us week after week. I know that I'm sort of the interloper here, but those are familiar names to me. But if you are here for the very first time, I want to welcome you as well. Enjoy the presentation. But also, if you're watching on the YouTube archive after the fact, I do want you to enjoy the show, but be aware that you're invited to join us in the live discussion. This one kicks off promptly 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Thursday afternoons, typically hosted by Ken Rose. But, uh, you're, of course, you're, you're welcome to come here. A uh, great place to, to uh, even ask questions during the discussion. Now, final heads up, we do have Barb Armstrong. She's going to be hanging out in the chats with the live uh, audience here today. She's going to be answering any questions as long as they're on topic. If I can't get to them, Barb's going to be there to help pick up that slack. Thanks for being there, Barb. And Barb and I would also like to issue an invitation to you if you're not following us on that platform, formerly known as Twitter, now known as X. That's a great additional resource where you connect with your favorite presenters. It's the best place to uh, to reach out to me in between these uh, these live streams. So you can find Barb at Barb Armstrong CS. You can find me. Uh, you can see my handle right there on your screen at Cameron May CS. Uh, but I'd love to have you there as a follower. All right, so with that said, let's get into the discussion. And as we do that, we have to set the stage regarding risk. Options certainly carry risk, as do uh, other approaches to uh, investing. So we need to bear these, th these important things in mind. Options carry a high level of risk and are not suitable for all investors. The information here is for general informational purposes only and should not be considered an individualized recommendation or endorsement of any particular security, chart pattern, or investment strategy. Schwab does not recommend the use of technical analysis as a sole means of investment research. Investing involves risks, including the loss of principal, and any investment decision you make in your self-directed account is solely your responsibility. All right. So with that said, let's set the agenda for the day. First thing that we're going to do to sort of set the stage for the discussion is to do a quick peek at current market conditions. It's been a shifty market recently. We've been enjoying a nice bull run on the major market indices, but pulling back. So we're going to take a quick peek at the S&P 500, and then we're going to shift gears and look at an individual option trade and talk through the sorts of difficulties that a self-directed options trader might encounter as they're trying to select an expiration and a strike price that seems appropriate for the trade that they have in mind. Now, to illustrate the pros and the cons, the sorts of the, the sorts of considerations that one might be weighing as they're selecting expiration and strike price, we're going to illustrate it using an example trade on the Thinkorswim platform. It's going to be real-time stuff, just paper money trade, but uh, hopefully that helps us connect to connect the dots of theory of selecting expiration and strike price to actual application. We'll even place a trade before we're done, okay? So let's go right to Thinkorswim Desktop. This is software that can be downloaded from your Schwab Online account. Just go to the Trade tab and look for the keyword Thinkorswim there, and you'll you'll be able, you'll be able to walk through the downloading of this software. But uh, let's take a quick peek at what's going on with the S&P 500. I don't intend to spend a lot of time on this, but it has been a nice run stretching back here to late October of last year. We ran up and up and up and up and up, ultimately achieving all-time S&P highs March 28th. It's been a different story over the last few weeks, though. We've been pulling back. Could this lead to a significant overall change in trend for stocks and for the portfolios that depend on them? Possibly. As of right now, the S&P is down right around 5%. And for some traders, they may look at that, okay, that, that may elevate, obviously, concerns, but it might also, for those that are looking, that we're looking for a pullback uh, from these all-time highs, maybe it represents a potential window of opportunity. Go ahead and chat in where you think the S&P is going to be going over the next few weeks. Could be interesting, could be vital to the outcome of this, uh, this example trade that we're going to be placing today. But um, let's just take the approach that maybe our hypothetical investor has been waiting for a pullback, okay? They've been, they've been wondering when is it going to happen, how long might it happen. One, 
One technical tool that's available on the Thinkorswim platform that might assist with this doesn't always work, but for some traders, they might employ something known as a Fibonacci retracement line when, uh, when a stock or an index has been going straight up for a long time and they're trying to gauge how much it might pull back after it starts to pull back. Yeah, Wayne, you're saying up, we'll see, we'll see, right? But in any case, let's come down here and change our active drawing tool. We have this whole menu of drawing tools. You'll see me typically, I just have it on a pointer or maybe I have it on the trend line tool, but we're gonna choose the Fibonacci retracements tool and this is sometimes used by those that are trying to gauge where might the areas of support and resistance be, all right? So let's go up here to those all-time highs. And it's interesting, we really started the most recent advance after about a one-week pullback. Back here, it's been all the way back to January since we had a full week of selling. Anyway, if we go to that high, I'm going to click up there on that high, pull back all the way down to those January lows. And uh, for a Fibonacci trader, this may be interesting. We've run up and look at how far this 5% pullback has drawn the S&P 500. It's actually pulled it down between the 61.8 and the 50% Fibonacci retracement range. Now, if you're not familiar with these lines, you can actually go out on YouTube, particularly check out my, my uh, webcast series, Getting Started with Technical Analysis, but just look for the keyword Fibonacci, F-I-B-O-N-A-C-C-I, but um, you'll, fee, you'll find a more in-depth discussion. Like right there, you can see Fibonacci retracements popping up on your screen right now. That's how that's spelled. But in any case, for those that use this tool, when there's been a strong advance on a stock or an index, quite commonly, they might look for a pullback extending down to between the 61.8 and the 50% retracement level. In many ways, this would be seen as a, as a pretty much textbook retracement. Now, does that guarantee that that the S&P is gonna bottom out and move up from here? Nope, it can continue going on down. But for some, this is kind of a key target range between these two levels. And look at where we're settling in right now. So let's just say that our hypothetical option trader out there who's trying to get their, fing their fingers on the pulse of the markets, and they're wondering whether this pullback is just a pullback or, um, if it is, you know, when when might it turn around? Let's just say that they've concluded they think it's it should be about due for a turnaround and a resumption of the previous trend. All right. Well, that might incline them to go out and do some sort of a bullish option strategy. Now, today, I wanted to keep the focus on expiration and strike selection, so I'm not going to get too fancy with the strategy that we're going to demonstrate today. We're just going to go with a long call, a pretty basic. Uh, options approach to trading bullish moves on uh, on stocks. And for today's example stock, and Doug, if you pointed out it is earnings season, isn't it? Yeah, today's example stock, that's going to be part of the discussion because there is an earnings announcement pending on this one. But here's Google or Alphabet. It's uh, obviously had a pretty good run over the last 12 months. Even during this pullback on the S&P 500, it's actually been holding up comparatively well right? The pullback on, on Google really only lasted about two days. And then it seems to be starting to advance again. So let's say that our trader thinks, oh, here's, maybe we think that the markets are about to turn and run and, and go higher. Maybe our stock is about to turn and run and go higher. How far might it go? And has it pulled back enough? Good question. So I'm going to, I'm going to um, use our Fibonacci tool again. So sorry, I'm leaning on the same tool a couple of times, maybe a little repetition might be useful, but, uh, but it's interesting historically how Alphabet here has tended to move in intact upward trends. And that is when there's a strong advance, maybe like this one here or this one here or this one here, when there's, a, when there's a, an upward trend or upward bias to price movement and there's a strong move upward within that upward trend, how much territory has Alphabet historically given back? Well, if we look at this advance right back here, see this where we bottomed out here, October 27th, that's the same time really that the S&P started its sort of meteoric climb. It ran up until November 22nd, so that was almost exactly a month, and then pulled back. Let's go back here, get our Fibonacci retracement tool, I'm going to click right at the top of that up move. 
and go down to the bottom of that up move. And interestingly here, it didn't settle out between 61.8 and 50. In this case, Alphabet ha has uh, gone down to the next Fibonacci line, the 38.2. So this volatility that seems to be inherent within, uh, within Google or Alphabet um, tends to move more to extremes maybe than other stocks or other indices. Instead of running up and pulling back, you know, 38 to 50 percent, it's pulled back a little bit further. Well, is that typical? Let's look at the next move. Here's another run up right here. Pretty rapid ascent in price on Google. Where did we go from from December 14th up until December 26th? Ran up about 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 10 percent. How much did it pull back? Well, here it pulled back. There's the 50 percent line. It actually pulled that back down right close to that 62% line again. Interesting. Now this next move, actually there was a smaller move here. Why not? This one kind of terminated. We started into a downward trend, but this one's still an intact upward trend. What about this smaller move? I click on that, move down here. What do you know? Hold down. There's our 50% line. We actually went down and touched that 62.8 percent line. Interesting. Well, more recently, we had a gap up. Let me zoom in here. It'll make it a little bit easier to see what I'm doing here. Strong gap up, a pullback, and then we started another advance. So let's go to the top of that move, down to the bottom of that advance. And where did we touch on the retracement? Pulled back about 68%. And most recently, this, this could be very interesting to our, tr our hypothetical trader out there. Well, if previous advances in an intact upward trend have pulled back about 60% of that, of that move up, how much have we pulled back since this peak from this trough? Well, we pulled back right down to that Fibonacci retracement again. Thaya says this is called two steps forward, one step backward. Yeah, this one's more like, this one's kind of like three steps forward, two steps backward if we're, if we're talking about the proportions, right? Yeah, but let's just say that our trader here has decided, wow, well, okay, so technically things look like they're setting up. Seems to be in alignment with the way the markets are moving. None of this is a guarantee that we're absolutely moving higher, but maybe this is dialing up the confidence of the trader. Okay, well, what we're about to do is a trade that may require some confidence. Let's just assume, actually, let's, let's throw that fib back on there. It may come in handy a little bit later, but let's zoom back out here. There we go. Um, where might the stock be going from here? Well, if we get a move that was proportionate to this one, that was about, about a $10 move. So if we bounce down here at about 150, I'm going to round it off to 154. Maybe we're about to, to uh, rally up to about 164. And possibly the trader is looking to leverage that. Well, let's go, let's, um, let's take that bit of technical data and go build a trade that seems suited to that outlook, all right? Now, let's, so, let's suppose the trader has decided, okay, we're gonna buy a long call. Decision made, well, which long call might we choose because there are long calls all over the place. Look at this. If we go to Google's option chain, we have calls going stretching all the way from tomorrow, the 19th of April, all the way out to the 18th of December of 2026. So which expiration might this trader use? And even within each of those expirations, there are multiple strike prices to be had. As a matter of fact, I have this limited to just 20 strike prices. If we dial this out to all the available strike prices, just in one expiration, look at how many choices we have. So how do we narrow the field? Okay, Thaya says sometimes doing no trade is the most profitable trade. That could definitely be the case. And as a matter of fact, with this trade that we're about to do, I will even say that's probably the case. Why would I say that's probably a case when I just went and went through all this trouble to, to lay some fundamental or some technical groundwork um, to describe why we might be doing the trade in the first place. Well, because inherently, long options are low probability trades. They just are. Yep. Because of time decay 
And because of the initial spread between the bid and the ask and the back end spread between the bid and the ask getting in, getting out of these positions, they are low probability trades. Now, does that mean they can't be traded profitably? I'm not saying that, but I am saying that, yeah, these are not high probability trades. If, if you wanna investigate high probability trades, I actually cover that in my, um, in my series, Managing an Options Portfolio. We weigh the pros and the cons of low probability versus high probability, low reward versus high reward. Okay, Blue Pool, hey, thank you. I might have to go back to that. That's a good suggestion for a future topic. Anyway, um, so question number one, let's a trader um, narrow the field. Well, we might look at this and say, well, do we wanna buy a call that expires tomorrow? Let's look at our chart. If the stock starts to move and maybe we're expecting it to, to make another $10 or not expecting, but hoping, anticipating that it might, right? It's made a $10 move here. And as a matter of fact, this one right here, we went from 146 up to 156. This move, the previous move before retracement was also a $10 move. So if we got $10 from here to here and $10 from here to here, maybe we might get another $10 taking us here. But if our contract runs out tomorrow, what, is, what does it look like the odds are that we're even gonna be in position to benefit from that move if it manifests? Not gonna be there, right? So one day is probably off the table for at least this technical scenario. We're trying to tailor the, the expiration that we choose for, the, for the, the technical scenario that we've determined on our chart. So what if we were to go out further? How about we come down here and we buy a contract that's 974 days? Those contracts, just as you, just so you know, are gonna be much more expensive than the shorter term contracts. Maybe here we're spending more money on more time than this trader needs. So what might be a rule of thumb? If it's somewhere between one day and three years, where's the sweet spot for this trader? Well, there is, a, there is a rule of thumb that some apply, and that is they might gauge how long they think their trade is likely to last, and then double that for the amount of time that they buy on the contract. So let's go back to our charts, and just let me zoom in again here. And if you'll notice these moves, these $10 moves, looks like this one back here was about two weeks. This one right here was about two weeks. This one was like a week and a half, okay? So if we get another $10, $10 move, is it gonna do it in a day? It might, but unlikely. If recent history is any indication, maybe we need to give this a couple of weeks. Could it be three? Sure. Might it not work out at all? Of course, that's a possibility. So the trader might say, well, okay, so I need two weeks. So do we go to our trade tab and just buy two weeks? We could go to this 3rd of May expiration that expires in 15 days, that's two weeks. Nope, what might be the trouble if we go with just the, just the right amount, just the minimum amount of time that the trader might possibly need to if everything works out perfectly? Well, each day in the life of a long option buyer for calls or, per, or for puts, doesn't matter, time is working against that trader. It's chipping away at their, at their efforts or, uh, for profits. So if time is a villain here, a potential villain, how might we mitigate some of that impact? Well, it may be worth paying for more time than we need to try to push off the impact as much as possible. Yeah, Chuck, that theta decay can be brutal on these trades, right? So as a common technique, some traders will look at the amount of time they actually need for the trade and then double it. And there's some mathematical logic to this. And that is because of the nature of time decay impacting these long options. When is the worst, if we, if we let's throw it up in air quotes, the worst amount of time, uh, time decay, if we're swimming upstream against the current of time decay, where is the, where is the, um, the hardest impact of time decay? Well, it actually kicks in harder and harder the more, the closer we get to expiration. Yep. So for, Options buyers quite commonly they try to avoid the latter half of 
of a, a contract time frame. So if they plan to trade for two weeks, what they might do is buy a four a four week contract and then exit before they hit those last two weeks. And we can actually demonstrate that um, on the platform. So here's here's a little quick formula. It's just a general rule of thumb. It's not perfect. It doesn't work work perfectly in every case. But generally speaking, no matter the length of the contract, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, two years, whatever, if the trader buys and exits um, at the halfway point of that contract, they will have, in, in, on average over time, they will have experienced about one third of the time decay. Now that can definitely not be the case if we're in the habit of trading deep out of the money options. Okay, let me show you this. This is what I'm talking about. Let's 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 go to this 17th of May contract. Let's say, all right, we're going to do a two week trade. This one has four weeks on it. How about we look at doing that one? Okay, just chose an expiration. And I want to introduce you to a tool here on Thinkorswim. Let's. I'm just going to use maybe the at the. We haven't selected a strike yet, so I'm just going to use the at the money. Our stock's trading right here at 156. I'm gonna go for the 160 contract just to illustrate the point. You'll notice this is trading between 540 and 550. Let's see how much time decay is likely to impact this contract. Let's assume we bought it and we let it run two of the four weeks and nothing happened. Price didn't move, volatility levels didn't change, just time decay. Well, there's a tool on Thinkorswim called Theo Price. Let's go to Theo Price. Nifty little tool here that can help a trader experiment with different variables, price and time and volatility, see what their impact might be. So I'm gonna choose on my layout, Theo price, and I can click right here in this area and it gives me a little calculator. And all I'm gonna do with this calculator is, you notice I just reset it, but let's go out here, let's click on the little calendar and build in some time decay. Now, as I've selected Theo price, you'll notice there's a column here that says, this is a theoretical price of our options. And right now our options are trading 445 to 550, or 545 to 550. So it's saying, all right, now the theoretical price is somewhere in that range. That's not terribly insightful. Well, I wonder what the theoretical price of this option would be two weeks from now, if nothing changed except time went by. If we bought this for 550 today, and time if time decay were linear, we would expect the, the future value of this option to be what, $2.75. Half our time goes by, it should cut the value of this option in half, right? Well, let's push this out to May 2nd. That's two weeks from today, okay? As I choose May 2nd, well, uh, don't need that. Anyway, um, the current price of our option, about 550. Two weeks from today, about 350. Wait a minute. That's only lost about two dollars of value. And half of our time has gone by. And by the way, this contract is out of the money, so it is pure time value. There's no intrinsic value to this option. So you're telling me, Cameron, that half our time went by. And I only lost about 37, 38% of the value of the option to time decay. Yep, that's what happens with time decay. Yeah. Now, actually, let me go back to that. That's not always the case. If you look at the further out of the money options, you can see those may drop more dramatically. Look at this one, $180 contract that's way out of the money. Maybe we're buying it for about 80 cents today. Two weeks go by, so that means there's still two weeks left. That thing's only worth, theoretically, about 16 cents. There's so little time left for that thing to get back in the money that it's decaying rapidly. So th this is sort of a rule of thumb, but going deeply out of the money on, on, on those options can really dial up that time decay impact, okay? All right, so that was going a little bit deeper than maybe I planned to go, but I thought that would be an interesting illustration. But just know, that when I say that for some traders, when they when they think they need a certain amount of time on an option and they buy twice as much, it's not just pulled from a hat. There's some logic behind that decision. Okay, so that's decision number one made. 
let's say that we're going to go with that 29-day contract, four-week contract for, when in, for an intended two-week trade. Now, one other, one other point I want to make before we move on to strike selection is that this is not that the trader is just getting two weeks of extra time just in case they need it. If this trade doesn't do well in the first two weeks, leaning into the last two weeks um, it might be sort of a desperation ploy. If the stock isn't going in the right direction in the first two weeks, is it likely to start behaving the last two weeks? It could, but now time decay is really kicking in. Anyway, don't we just don't want to necessarily be in the habit of uh, of just saying, "Well, I still have some time. Let's see what happens." Okay, that can be dangerous. Anyway, so now let's talk about strike selection, and really, this comes down to a decision of in the money versus out of the money. Yes, we could throw at the money in there, but even at the money is just sort of a, a concept. Basically, all options are either to some degree in the money or they're to some degree out of the money. And, and uh, the amount to which a trader goes in or out of the money actually dramatically influences the leverage that's delivered by the option. So let's do a little comparison here. I want to go with an in the money option and an out of the money option for point of comparison. And let's say that we have, let's say 5,000 bucks that the trader is intending to invest in this trade, okay? Well, so just grabbing one, let's say we go for that 145 strike price. Let's come over here. Well, yeah, let's do this. Let's come over here, open up our scratch pad. And let's say we have example trade A. And this is an in the money, long call, okay? And how about here, we're sticking with the same expiration for both, but let's say that we that, that our trader is weighing buying an in the money versus an out of the money contract. So we're gonna buy the 17th of May. Um, we said the 145 call. And that looks like that's trading between 1445 and 1465 right now. Let's call it 1455. All right, so um, that'd be $1,455 for one contract. We could, we could squeeze in three contracts inside our hypothetical $5,000 budget. Anyway, so let's say that we, maybe we think of doing three of these, okay? But I wanna talk about leverage for just a moment. Oh, and by the way, as a heads up, let me just hit the pause button for just a second. I just noticed that there's been a survey link that's been added to the chat window for those that are in the uh, live stream right now. So if you would do me a favor here, uh, yeah, Barb says survey time, just click that survey link if you are here for the live stream, it'll populate the survey on your screen, then you can just park it off to the side and come back to it after the webcast is over, you can give me some, some uh, honest feedback. But I'll, I'll tell you that uh, if you take the time to fill out that survey, and it really only takes a minute, two multiple choice questions, a comment box and a suggestion box, but if you fill out that survey, I'll take the time to read it. I read through that data, I read through your comments, it always helps, okay? So it's never a wasted effort. Thanks for that. Thanks, Barb, for, for reposting that. But back to the discussion, let's talk leverage for this, for just a moment. And this and this, this element, we've already talked about the potential impact of time decay. Leverage can be a major deciding factor in choosing the strike price. Because um, when I first started learning about calls, I thought, okay, I got it. So a call gives me the right to buy a stock, true. I pay a certain amount for it, correct. And it has leverage, all right? Well, my assumption was that the leverage on each strike price was the same as the leverage on other strike prices, and that could not be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, whichever strike price is, whatever strike price, price is selected, the trader can select that to get very precise degrees of leverage. If they're really confident, maybe they want a lot of leverage. If they're maybe not so much, maybe they're, they're worried about that S&P really turning around, maybe they don't want as much leverage. And yeah, uh, I knew somebody, well, I mentioned earlier that earnings are a consideration. There is an earnings announcement about one week from today for Alphabet. And for some traders, they prefer not to trade around earnings. For others, though, they, they can see that as a potential uh, enhancement of the of the potential profitability of the trade, it can work either way, right? So yeah, that's a consideration, Andy, but 
aside from that, I'm not going to go further into this. This isn't necessarily an earnings play, so to speak, um, but it is a consideration for some traders. Okay. Anyway, let's talk leverage here. How much leverage does this 145 call have and how can a trader gauge that? Well, Delta might gauge that for us. So I'm gonna come up here to our layout again. Let's do a customization of our layout, right? We have Theo Price and Mark here, let's remove those. And I'm gonna put our Greeks in here, not all of them. I'm gonna do Delta, let's add that. Let's search for Theta and add that. And let's throw Vega in here and add that. But our focus is just gonna be really on Delta. Let's click OK. So here are our Greeks. And I'm gonna to go to that 145 strike price and look at its Delta. Let's examine that and its implications for the leverage of this option. Now, Delta has other implications other than just leverage. So, um, so for example, it can relate to the probability of an op option expiring in the money, okay? Or out of the money. But um, let's talk about Delta as a measure of leverage. So we know that our stock, our, that, pardon me, our strike price that we are eyeballing at the moment was trading for one for 14.55. Oops, it's only worth about 14.15 or 14.20 right now. It's actually slipped. It's actually lost in the last few minutes two percent of its value. Why did that happen? Well, because the stock price moved a bit. Now, stock price has not gone down two percent. Stock price went down a bit, and this option leveraged that into a fairly significant loss. So here's the way Delta works. The delta on this contract is currently 77. So what the trader can do to gauge the amount of leverage that, ha that they have is our delta is, is, in addition to being a probability metric, it can also tell us how much we might make or lose on the stock moving up or down $1. So if, uh, if Google were to rise from 156 to 157, a $1 move up, that would be about two thirds of 1% uh, move on the stock. But on our option that we theoretically paid $14.55 for, I'm gonna dial this down. Looks like we can get it for less than that right now. Anyway, we're able to buy it for $14.25. The stock goes up a dollar. Our option stands to make about 77 cents in unrealized profit on that $1 move. How much of, of a gain is that? 77 cent return on a $14.25 investment is about 5%, 5.4%. So the stock moves up a dollar, less than 1%. The option um, makes 5.4%. That's leverage. That's a multiple of seven, eight, nine times just uh, it's, it's more like seven or eight times the the leverage of you know unleveraged stock position, right? So that's great if the stock goes up. Not so good if the stock goes down, right? If the stock goes down, we might lose seven or eight percent. And as a matter of fact, since we started this discussion, this option has lost about two percent of its value. All right. So that's just illustrating how this leverage can work for us. It can also work against us. So 77 cents, let's kind of throw in the math here on a 14.25 investment is about 5.4% is about on a $1 move on the stock up or down. So we'll just say plus or minus, okay? So for some traders, that may just be just what they're looking for. Awesome. Um, maybe they're really convinced, they're feeling quite confident that, yeah, okay, so maybe we stumbled a little bit over the last few minutes, but overall, they think over the next couple of weeks, we're really looking to head higher here. Well, for some, though, they may say, well, 5.4%, that's, that's good leverage, but I want to dial it up even more. Where does a trader go? This is where it's counterintuitive. What might the trader want to do with their delta if they wanna dial up the leverage on this option position, get more leverage. Well, you might think, oh, more leverage, it must mean that we want our delta to go up because that would give us a higher pennies on the dollar return, right? 
That's true. But it also costs us more to go for higher delta. So kind of counter, uh, counterintuitively, the trader may go for a lower delta to get higher leverage. So let's do a comparison here. Maybe let's look at the 165 call. So let's go for example trade, copy this, example trade B, fit them both on the same screen. And this one, we're gonna do an out of the money long call. Instead of buying the 145, we're gonna buy the 165, giving us the right to buy shares for 165 bucks, right? Well, that's gonna cost less. It's trading between 340 and 350. Looks like about 345, all right? How many contracts could we fit into our $5,000 budget? Divide that by a $345 cost, about 14 contracts, okay? Yeah, we can buy a lot more of these. So we're buying the contracts. If we just bought one contract and the stock goes up a dollar, how much does that trader stand to make on that $1 move? Well, they might make 33 cents. And you think, well, geez, 33 cents versus 77 cents, I'm making less. Now that's true on an absolute basis, but if we compare it to how much we spent, that's actually really close to a 10% return. Let's look at this, 33 cents, on not a 425 purchase, but a 345 purchase, it's gonna come up just shy of 10%. What's that gonna be, nine and a half? 33 divided by 345, yep, 9.6%. So let me just restate that to show the degree of leverage here. If this $150 stock goes up $1, that's less than 1%, this trader stands to make, now this is obviously setting time decay aside, putting a pause on volatility changes, but this trader would make uh, an unrealized gain of about 9.6%. If the stock drops though, they could lose 9.6%. So that leverage works in either direction. So which one of these? Let's just go back to the setup for this trade. This trade tells us to buy which one of these. It actually doesn't tell us precisely. What the trader needs to decide is, well, if I'm quite confident in this, if I want to dial up the leverage here, I might go for that lower delta, higher leveraged position. If I'm not as confident, maybe I want to ease back and not have quite a, as bumpy a ride, maybe spend a little bit more by that lower, uh, by, by that higher delta contract with the less leverage. Okay, and the leverage extends even beyond just the percentages. If the stock were to go up, if we've had three contracts, let's do some more math here. Let's say that we did those three contracts and the stock goes up a dollar. Well, 77 cents times three is about a $231 potential unrealized gain or loss if it goes the other direction, right? Just based on the number of contracts purchased and the delta accomplished on that $1 move. Down here, it's 14 times the delta. The so 14 times 33, 462. Really what that works out to be is 231 is about 5.4% of the $5,000 invested. 462 is about 9.6% of the $5,000 invested, okay? That's just a different way to gauge the degree of leverage. But yes, uh, while that actually worked out to be exactly twice the potential return or risk, right? Now, this is not, uh, in, this discussion is not intended for me to say, okay, this is exactly which one you should choose. If a trader's out there making uh, or placing trades, they need to make these decisions for themselves. I've just done a comparison of an in the money versus an out of the money contract. And uh, this should actually just paint the sort of picture for how these can be tailored. For some traders here, they might be looking at this and saying that 5.4% nice, but still scary to me. 
if they were if they were taking the same five thousand dollars and they wanted some leverage, but less than what's even offered on this, where might they go spend that five thousand? Well, they might go even further in the money. They might go for a higher delta contract and buy fewer contracts. If someone is saying, hey, Cameron, that 9.6% sounds great, but I have the tolerance for risk to dial it up even further, they may actually go out even further on the, on the strikes chosen. So which one are we going to do for today's discussion? How about we let's just go for that the, uh, the one that we started with, the 145. Let's do three contracts, keeping the investment to three uh, to 5,000 bucks. I'm going to click on that uh, on the ask price for that 145 strike. And that's going to start to build an order for me down here. And let's just dial that up to three contracts. Yeah, naturals at 1425. I'll go ahead and leave the limit order at 1425. See if we can get an order filled at that price. As we submit a limit order, even if we feel like we're being generous for how much we're willing to spend, it's not a guarantee that that order is going to fill. Okay, okay. Let's click confirm and send. And we're going to buy three of those 145 calls. 1425, that would bring our cost to, yep, under that $5,000 hypothetical maximum that we wanted to spend. That also represents the most that could be lost on this trade, theoretically. And there is a commission to be considered here. Let's send this order off. That's how that trade might be executed. There we go. All right. Well, everyone, we've actually accomplished what I wanted to to, uh, to cover as we set out today. We wanted to discuss how might a trader select expiration, and we talked through the logic of that, and how might a trader select strike prices when trading options. So um, I hope this has been insightful for you and introduced maybe some new tools or maybe uh, different usages uh, of, of familiar tools. But... I'm gonna let Ken come back, pick up his series where he left it off last week, but you, you're certainly invited to join me in my regularly scheduled uh, webcast series. So I wanna make you aware of some additional resources that, that can help you keep tabs on me and on Barb and the rest of your coaches. All of these available, no cost to you. Uh, first of all, if you're not following Barb and me on X, please do that. Great resource there. This is where you can get my you know, thoughts on current market developments. You can find me at Cameron May CS. You can find Barb at Barb Armstrong CS. Uh, this is where you can, you know, do things. Oh, look at this. Speaking of Ken Rose, this is a, a tweet of a, a tweet or a post of his that I retweeted or reposted. Thought that was uh, some good information. Thanks for that, Ken. But also, if you haven't subscribed to our Trader Talks channel, do that. Go right down below the uh, display window right now, click on subscribe or go down the lower right hand corner, click on subscribe if you haven't done that already. And it just allows you to get notifications of when new webcasts are coming out. Also, YouTube is the best place to find our webcasts organized by topic into series. So if you wanted to you know, go to our playlists here, you can find all sorts of uh, topics from um, from uh, getting started with options to getting started with with a technical analysis to advanced option strategies to uh, investing all organized into into a series playlist okay and of course you can join the live streams here as well so follow us on x subscribe to the channel that's always appreciated also definitely appreciate the 30 people who have already clicked the live button uh, cl click the like button here in the live stream. Thank you very much for that. It always sounds like applause to me when you click that like button. So if you're if you're here live, click the like button. If you're watching the recording, click the like button. It's all um, it's all observed and appreciated. Okay. Thank you, Debbie and Tom and Greg. Everybody, remember to fill out that survey. Barb has reposted that again. I'll let you go do that. But I'll uh, I'll step aside. Let Ken come back again next week. I'll see you in a future webcast. I'll also look for you on X, but hey, uh, until the next moment, moment when we see each other again, until that moment arrives, I want to wish the very best of luck. Happy trading. Bye-bye.